Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining this uh, afternoon session on safeguarding in sport. My name is Sean Cottrell, I'm the CEO and founder of Law in Sport. I'll say it a couple of times as we wait for people to uh, drop into the Zoom call. Um, for those of you that have been tuning in already uh, as part of the Law in Sport annual conference, um, you'll be familiar with me waffling on for a couple of minutes whilst everyone logs in and gets, uh, uh, and gets up to speed with their Zoom accounts. Um, if you haven't tuned in to any of the sessions before, we're delighted to welcome you. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please use the Q&A feature rather than the chat. It's great if people do want to introduce themselves, uh, talk about uh, you know where they're from, the organisation they're representing, you want to meet other attendees, um, then please feel free to, to use the chat feature. But if you have any particular questions, please use the Q&A feature. Now, Unlike some of the other sessions that we've had uh, thus far, this is a uh, particularly um, sensitive and important area. And the other sessions have all been incredibly important as well, but this one in particular is a very sensitive uh, area. So therefore, please, in the chat, please be mindful about that. If you are introducing yourself or you're sharing opinions, please just take that into consideration um, if you are you know, just casually chatting away. Now, um, I'll say it again, just because we've got some, some more people who have just joined. My name is Sean Cottrell. I'm the CEO and founder of Law and Sport. This session forms part of the Law and Sport 6th Annual Conference. Uh, we're delighted to welcome you. Um, there's guests that we've got also who are uh, just registered for this session. We felt that today's sessions on safeguarding and then the exploitation in women's sport is something that uh, is so important that we just didn't feel right just to, to let only attendees of the conference and that's something we should share. The videos will also uh, go up onto our YouTube channel with the agreement of the speakers, which I believe they've already given. And now, <laughs> now they kind of have to. <laughs> but um, no, uh, joking aside, uh, it's all going to be uh, available there. So the format will be we'll hear from the speakers. We will take questions from the floor um, throughout the, the, the session. So if you do have any, please do ask them. And I hope, and it is our intention, um, for this session that you come away with a better understanding of the issues facing the sports sector and how more importantly the sports sector can be much better at dealing with safeguarding issues you know and protecting individuals participants athletes and um you know everyone in sport and i think you know like all of our speakers and our fabulous speakers um you know we care deeply about this issue and i'm sure you do as well hence why you're attending so thank you now what we're going to do, if you haven't tuned in before, each speaker is going to introduce themselves because you're probably already tired of hearing from me. So, James, thank you for joining. Um, could you introduce yourself? I, I will. Thank you very much, Sean, for having us. I'm, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be joining such a, if I may say so, such an illustrious panel as we've got this afternoon. Um, my, I'm a, I'm a, um, a barrister practicing mainly in, in this field of work. Um, much of my work recently is in the area of acting for claimants against sporting clubs and bodies for safeguarding failures, which have led to um, the incredibly serious abuse of young athletes and sports people, causing lives to be ruined even before they've really started, much of which in the cases that I'm mostly involved in occurred in the 1980s and 1990s. And I'm uh, representing a large number of claimants who, are, who were sexually abused many for years by football coaches working for some of the most high profile professional clubs, including one which was tried in the High Court in London earlier this year and resulted in a judgment against um, one of those clubs, in this case, Blackpool uh, Football Club. Um, uh, so that's a very brief sketch Thank of you. the sort of work that I do. Thank you, and we'll, we'll come back to that shortly. Jenny. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Smith and I'm a criminal barrister and worked for the Crown Prosecution Service for 10 years um, as a rape and sexual offences specialist prosecutor. So that meant that I dealt with a lot of non-recent cases, um, lots of cases with, with multi-defendants, lots of defendants, lots of victims. Um, for the past five years, I have been um, the director of Safeguarding Today, which is a safeguarding training company. And most recently, for the past two years, I have been contracted by the EFL uh, to work with the, the safeguarding team there at the EFL. Uh, I was leading the project to implement and create a, a consistent quality assured safeguarding training 
course for all the uh, designated safeguarding officers, so everyone in clubs uh, within the EFL system um, who has ultimate responsibility for safeguarding. So at the moment, working very closely with um, clubs and at NGB level as well, um, and so quite current, um, obviously, because I'm working daily with them. So um, I'm oh, really you. pleased to be here. Thanks very much, Sean, for asking me. Oh, thank, thank you, and thanks for the instructions. John? Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm John Merza, QC at Littleton Chambers. Uh, I'm a specialist in sports law. The, the particular angle I come from is slightly different to James, who um, spends a lot of time in the civil courts, and he mentioned his cases. My, my angle is my background in independent reviews in sport, and um, I was on the panel of the first review into the culture and climate of British cycling which looked at a whole series of um, issues um, about uh, workplace safety, not simply for athletes, but also coaches. Um, then subsequently, I looked at the British Equestrian Federation that was slightly more governance focused, but I was um, operating alongside um, retired police uh, officers as part of the investigations uh, and were dealing with some uh, um, kind of vulnerable uh, adults in that context. And then most recently, um, UK Athletics, again, uh, slightly more governance focused. Um, but uh, because of all of that, I've, I've assisted with training at sports resolutions uh, for the kinds of investigations that I've been part of. Uh, and most recently, um, I've been working close with Tani in relation to her um, historic now uh, duty of care report, which I'm sure we'll touch on in a few moments. Thank you, John. Anne. Thanks very much, Sean. Uh, my name's Anne Tevis. I uh, was the former director of the NSPCC's Child Protection in Sport Unit and worked there for nearly 20 years, before which I was in uh, the social work profession for 20 years, focused almost entirely on child protection work. For the last 20 years, I've focused entirely on uh, child protection and abuse of adult athletes in sport. I now chair Safe Sport International. I was a member of Tani's review group for the duty of care review. And I sit currently sit on FIFA's um, child safeguarding advisory group and chair the international safeguards for children in sport group. So thanks very much for inviting me. And it's nice to see you all. And thank you. And we'll come back to it later, but could you just tell people about Safe Sport International just in case they're not familiar? Okay, thank you. So, uh, Safe Sport International is a UK based international charity that aims really to support the capacity of organisations to properly safeguard everyone in sport. And we do that through influencing, through consultancy, through education and to working, trying to really trying to work in collaboration with a wide range of organizations so that we don't duplicate effort so that we can share learning um, and that includes working pe with people with lived experience of abuse as our our experts thank you very much that's brilliant thank you you do some great work as well um so as everyone does but uh, thank you for that uh tani or should I, sorry, I should be more formal, Baroness Tani. <laughs> <laughs> Tani, thank you. Uh, I'm Tani Gray-Thompson. I'm uh, a Paralympian ex-athlete. Uh, I'm now a crossbench peer in the House of Lords. And in 2017, I um, published uh, a government review into duty of care in sport. And uh, I was always interested in how people in sport were treated as an athlete. And then that sort of came into my, my wider life in, in terms of politics. And the thing that keeps me going um, on this and why I believe there's a need for change is I am now slightly over people being shocked by the culture that exists in sport. But also someone in sport said to me when I was asked to do it, there's nothing to say, you can go away and write your little report. And that has sort of quite plainly shown out uh, almost monthly that there is a lot to see in sport. Sport is amazing and incredible, but it, it needs to change uh, and it needs to change quite rapidly. Uh, thank you, Tony. And that's a, a, a great sort of introduction to to sort of the first question really which is to James now in something that I said as many of you who have been listening you know I'm always the sharpest tool in the box as we would say in the UK but uh, the one thing that I have observed is that you would think that that looking after the welfare of participants is the number one two three four five you know priority for sports organizations um, sadly it seems that there hasn't always been 
the thing that drives uh, I think a lot of behavioral change is when the purse strings are damaged within sports. So when there's financial harm, so as we saw with the World Anti-Doping Agency, with the creation of that, when there was a doping scandal, the sponsors got very upset, started to look, they'll pull away and WADA was created. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that with safeguarding cases in particular, uh, cases of abuse, has been that there um, hasn't been that uh, connection now, James. This is very relevant to the work that you're talking about in the in the cases you've been involved with. Can you talk about how that is now changing? Because it seems like that might be something quite pivotal in terms of making sure that as uh, that it becomes um, uh, easier for people working in this arena to actually broach this with the directors and the, um, the executives working in sports organisations. Sorry, you're muted. Sorry. I think I think it's automatically muted you. It wasn't yeah, me. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to stay off off, off mute. I think um, you hear um, lots of horrendous stories um, now and going back years. But essentially, the universal feature which we see time and again in these abuse cases, either non recent abuse cases or even those closer to now, is that um, the very young athletes have nobody to talk to, nobody within the club organization to whom they can speak for a variety of reasons, but mostly certainly in, in the time and of the cases in which I've been dealing with recently, because simply there was nobody to talk to. There was nobody there. There were no systems in, in place. Um, and, and, and time and again, you come across the same thing. All the young athletes, sports people know what knew what was happening even to the extent that they and others from other clubs would have nicknames for the abusers um the case that i referred to um the blackpool case the abuser is a man called frank roper who was known by all the boys as roper the groper of course everybody knew what was taking place but there was nobody there nobody to whom they could turn it just happened no systems in place to give the survivor the confidence to come forward and the power of the coach was such that any such disclosure to others would of course spell the end of that young person's sporting ambitions. So I suppose um, yes you're right Sean to say that um, money is everything but also winning it's that culture of winning at all costs which uh, needs to needs to change and perhaps to an extent has changed um, because it's that culture which leads to undue pressure being put on these young athletes by those in in the positions of coaches and managers and scouts and so forth who 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 have control over um, the, their ambitions and aspirations. So I suppose there are two questions which we may want to look at. First is, are we doing things better now? Uh, and of course, secondly, what do we do? what do we still have to do to learn how to minimize the risks in the future? Thank you. And so one thing I did want to point out, and obviously we had a prep call uh, to discuss this, was the, the point that you made that in this situation, and so forgive me for those people who are listening, I wasn't trying to insinuate that people were just bringing claims to, to, to um, receive damages. Um, James, you uh, said on the call that, that often the victims and survivors are bringing claims because they want to have it acknowledged of the fact that something has happened. Yeah. It just so happens that that, um, would you agree though, that the um, the risk of public exposure through well, more public exposure, reputational harm through damages being awarded is something that could be um, one taken very seriously by the organisations and something that could could make things improve? I hope so. Um, certainly, the, um, the the damage, financial damage, and uh, as we all know, that the damages in the civil courts that one gets for the most horrendous abuse, um, leading to, you know, as I've said, lifelong injuries, is 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 really very small indeed, unfortunately. But of course, the the, the costs sometimes are not. But there's reputational damage as well. I think. Um, I do, I do wonder sometimes representing claimants in, in, in civil claims, they report, uh, survivors report something. First thing that happens of course, is that the club or the organization carry out some kind of investigation. Well, that's never satisfactory for the survivors, uh, the perception of lack of independence. Um, sometimes of course it's reported to the police. How often 
for no doubt for good legal reasons, can the police and Crown Prosecution Service not take it any further uh, and the damage that some, that can sometimes cause. Uh, th then we have um, uh, the, 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 the civil court process. Well, that's a confrontational one. Um, there's a risk always that both sides adopt an entrenched position. Um, uh, and uh, there's a, sometimes, I think we touched on it already, an inability of, of uh, uh, the lawyers for the defense to advise their clients, even to accept that the abuse took place, even when there's a conviction uh, and even when they don't have any evidence to contradict it. And, and that was a feature, in fact, of the Blackpool case and something for which the club came under quite a lot of criticism from the judge. Um, and of course, the, the cases take years, years um, to, 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 come for, to, to, to be completed. And then there's the low level of awards at the end. And then, of course, there's John's field, which is the, um, the inquiries. Um, we'll hear, no doubt, from, from John about that. But one of the features of that, unfortunately, particularly with claimants who are involved in civil claims as well, is, is that um, they're sometimes advised, rightly or wrongly, not to take part in inquiries, lest it affects their civil claim. And I, I do wonder sometimes, perhaps I'll just throw this out, whether, whether it, it would be possible to have some kind of independent, genuinely independent, and, and of course, John's inquiries are, but sometimes they're not perceived as such, if particularly those inquiries which are started up by a particular club, um, a genuinely independent investigating and tribunal process. Because very often for the claimant, for the survivor, it isn't the money that they're after. Yeah. As you said it before I started this rather long answer, as you <laughs> said, um, it, it's the it's the acknowledgement of responsibility for what took place, which the certainly the clients that I represent want so, more than anything. So, so on that point, then, so, um, but so it can be difficult for the so the victim and survivors to uh, bring claims. It sounds rather unsatisfactory in terms of how the process works and yeah. and, the, and and all the the emotional uh, and mental stress that goes along with that. However, you know, again from a club's perspective or a league's perspective or others, it can be you know difficult for them. So it could be uh, something again that they should hopefully be an R, I think, and this is where Jenny comes in, um, hopefully looking to avoid that because you'd like to think that most of the people working in these organizations want to prevent these things happening. Yeah. Uh, Jenny, can you talk about the work that you're doing and if, if what James has said has resonates with you? So while answering James's first question, are we doing things better now? Well, I can only speak for, for the experience I've had in the past couple of years with the EFL. Um, and I just acknowledge that um, Alex, at the, the head of state, state of the EFL, is on, on um, this webinar. Um, so I'm sure she will she will comment if you know if she if she feels ne it's necessary. All I have seen um, the past two years is positive direction and direction towards a future, acknowledging the past um, and, and certainly wanting to learn from mistakes of the past, but certainly from the NGB's point of view, they are trying to assist as best they can and improve the skills of the designated safeguarding officers. Obviously, there's quite a high number of DSOs in, in the yeah. EFL, we've got 72, and they come from a wide um, variety of backgrounds. Some have police backgrounds, some have youth work or social work backgrounds. So they're experienced in their previous life. However, there are a lot of um, safeguarding officers who don't come to the table with that, that experience. And what the EFL are trying to do is to try and have that consistent approach. So all 72 have um, a, a mandatory requirement now to, to complete these eight core modules. Um, in various different contemporary mm -hmm. topics, um, and what we what we have implemented is is making sure that they have to provide evidence of their learning. So we want to know. Well, it's all very well you going on a, a CSE course and learning all about CSE, but what actually doing with that knowledge? How are you going to implement it? In Sorry, course? CSE. Just yeah, to make sorry, sure you... child sexual exploitation. So, so CSE is child sexual exploitation. So, if they go on a course. Um, they will, you know, they'll learn about the, uh, the signs and symptoms and things like that. So they'll have that course. And what do they do? The key is for the quality assurance is what do you do with that knowledge? How are you going to go away as a safeguarding leader in the club? And how are you going to teach other staff, academy staff, 
how are you going to educate the academy players and to make sure that they understand what CSE looks like, what exploitation looks like. Um, and as an NGB, um, we, we will be eventually, when COVID ends, <laughs> hopefully, um, we will be gathering that information and being able to evidence their learning um, as they move forward. So from, you know, to answer the question, are we doing things better now? That is one aspect, as we all know, of a football club. That is one role the designated safety mm. officer. You know, there are plans to move that forward. You know, the, the conversation at the moment is about board level. You know, how do we get that's to... What, that, that's exactly what I was going to ask is in terms of how... how and so here, how do you do that, right? So one of the, the problems has been that I've observed in this in this um, arena is there's uh, fantastic people working in safeguarding. Uh, at, you know, the, the, all of you are, are, are and know these individuals. But I turn up to events... Um, some of them organized, I think, by hand organization, um, and it's full of safeguarding officers or DSOs, right? And there's no board members there, there's no executives there, there's no senior management there, there's no there's no one else. And it seems to me that they are often the 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 the, the gatekeepers, or at least so in terms of making sure there's the right funding, making sure it goes on to board minutes and, and the meetings and how it goes up on the agenda. So what's your perspective on that? So there's an appetite there how does that how does that look and then that's what i want to bring in Anne from because we talk about from a domestic perspective on the international front so maybe we go to just jenny and then Anne. okay so in relation to um particularly the efl um there is you know there are plans to expand the the learning process um, that that then goes over to the board and the owners and um, there have there has been board um training um and again obviously when you start looking at um going up the, the levels you've got board members who might live in 15 different countries in some clubs you've got um i, I spoke to a, a premier league club this morning they have three board members they're all in the uk um but then owners um, might live around the the, the world now I, I would say that that is one of the benefits that has come out of um this global pandemic is that it's made the world a lot smaller hasn't it by the this you know, by, by the way of, of um, us all having to to complete our work online so for me, I don't think there's that. As a child protection professional, there's no excuses as far as I'm concerned. So um, I, I, my view is that um, we all should be able to knock on the door and say, as professionals, to say, well, actually, it's your legal responsibility as a board. It should be on the agenda um, and, and, and be brave in that conversation and, and perhaps um, talk the language of the board as well. You know, boards have reports. They have to look at accounts. Are they... You know, in their accounts, are they asking their accountants to consider child abuse allegations within their risk um, factors of their accounts? Because that's how boards work. They, they need mm. to, you know, that you need to speak their language. So certainly at board level, um, that's certainly a, a one kind of bugbear of mine that I want mm. to make sure that, that you speak, the, you know, speak the language that they mm. understand. Um, and make it quite clear it is their responsibility it's in statutory guidance it's in statute safeguarding is everybody's responsibility you know whether you live in in a different country to the uk but your organization is based in the uk you still have a legal responsibility to the children that you provide services to that to, in the club that might be a first team member yeah. job that might be yeah. you know first yeah, team yeah. player um in a in a any club premier league efl club uh, um, it's, they're a child do, they're under 18. Do, do you, do you think though that um, before we come on to Anne, let's get your view on this. You just made me think about the review that's taking place because of particularly being driven by the lack of diversity in sports governance and the code for sport governance in the UK. And obviously, Anne, you, you're involved with FIFA, and FIFA have been doing a lot of stuff to actually drive down changes through having control metrics to say, right, if you're going to get certain access to grants, if you're going to do certain things, you need to meet some requirements. Is it something that we could see? being raised up the agenda item for example with this current review for the code for sport governance in the in the, in in the uk anyway at least that this becomes you know mm. a much more um a higher profile point that means they're mandated if they're going to receive government funding less obviously important for the premiership football but particularly important though for other sports that they have to report on these type of issues and anyway and i'll hand over to you yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think you need oh, somebody's decided to ring me now. Stop it. <laughs> Why Great does that timing. Happen? Sorry. Great. <laughs> absolutely perfect time. Okay. <laughs> Let me turn her off. That's my assistant. Sorry. <laughs> um, sorry. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> rewind. 
So it's, it's absolutely my view that you need to do two things. You need to both support organisations to increase their capacity because many, particularly in the international scene at the moment, really don't know where to start. It's a relatively new area for them. They don't have the knowledge, they don't have the infrastructure and they really need support to get there. But equally, you need to be able to hold organisations to account. So my view is absolutely that this should be top of the governance agenda. And um, I'm going to throw my phone away. So <laughs> You need a draw to put it. <laughs> okay top of top of the governance agenda and uh sorry it should be top of the governance agenda it should be the top of risk registers and building on what jenny uh, said said earlier when we first started in the child protection in sport unit there was a huge focus on creating these designated uh, officer roles both from national down to club level but however, while we focused on that, it really wasn't the issues weren't being owned at board level and at governance level. And I think with all of the international work we do now, that's the start point, really, is that we need to get into boards. We need to help boards to understand what their roles and responsibilities are. And then also to support organisations that are strengthening their governance requirements. So FIFA, for instance, taking a lead on this, putting requirements on their national federations, but also providing them with a range of sport and showing that lead leadership is absolutely critical. Um, likewise, the Association of Summer Olympic uh, Sports now requires its uh, international federations to report on what they're putting in place. I don't think at the moment that there's enough accountability there and enough quality assurance, and there isn't a mechanism for doing that globally, for making sure that these are, these are put in place, but that's absolutely what we need to, to see for the future. So is it, uh, uh, we'll come we'll come on to this uh, uh, shortly then about accountability, mm -hmm. which I think is a, is a is a really great point. But before we do, there is one thing when we talk about this in, from an international perspective. That's something we talked about, um, and Jenny, you alluded to this. Talk the language that people understand. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably worth focusing on the internationally. The term safeguarding is not actually you know widely recognised. I know UNICEF have done loads of work on this, and FIFA took the approach to call their initiative a guardian's initiative as opposed to um, safeguarding because it seemed to translate into languages uh, better. Is that correct, Anne, as an assessment? Yeah. Yeah, so um, essentially what they're doing, both things, they're both providing a toolkit that sets out what organisations need to put in place and what FIFA's expectations are. And I'd also say UEFA have created a toolkit as well to help their uh, organisations, but they will also strengthen, look to strengthen the requirements and to ensure that those things are properly being put in place over time. Because I just thought, so mm. I'll bring it back, uh, not to labour the point, but I probably am, uh, but yeah. on the Guardian's point, which I thought was interesting yeah. when, they, when they did the announcement that was about, so who's accountable um, mm -hmm. and who's responsible, that everyone is responsible. Mm -hmm. So you're all essentially guardians and everyone should uh, take ownership over that rather than just as you were saying, having the, mm -hmm. the DSOs as being, right, it's solely your responsibility, then we don't have to worry about it. Um, yeah, I'm not I sure if that's... Yeah, absolutely. And it should be seen as every department in every um, organisation uh, that it's everybody's responsibility and it should be clear what each each department's specific role and responsibilities are and those should be reported to the board on every agenda. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. John, you look ready to... Did you have something you want? <laughs> um, it always gives an indication I'm ready to pounce. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really um, interested in in the initial question, which I think James um, discussed and then Jenny took on, which is, are we doing things better now? And, and I'm interested in discussing that before, perhaps later on, we look into the structures that, that, that will feed onto what James has mentioned in terms of independence and Jenny has mentioned has been rolled out in certain organisations. Um, I, I can speak really from a domestic perspective and I, and I will defer to Anne in terms of more international levels. I don't think there's any doubt that there is a much greater awareness of safeguarding and related issues now than there has been. I also don't think there's any doubt that certainly in terms of funded sports and, and, and those that are a high profile and high, highly remunerative sports, that uh, there are policies in place to a much greater extent than the times that James alluded to back in the 80s. And I've met many um, dedicated um, DSOs, board members, uh, NGB board members and IFs who uh, mention and discuss this issue uh, with me. But of course, there is a um, not always a connection between having uh, systems in place 
and the implementation of those systems in reality. And um, I, 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 I don't think it would be acceptable, certainly in terms of funded sports here, not to have those systems in place. I mean, that would be an immediate red flag to the funding organisations. But if I try and take that on uh, further, um, I, I don't think we're looking back at non-recent issues um, of the 80s or 90s or even early 2000s. If I just think about the seven commissioned independent reviews since 2016, there has been a recurring theme domestically, which are two points really. Uh, one is a so-called culture of fear. And what that means is that the same issue that James alluded to, as in, um, we do not have enough trust and confidence in the system to actually report these concerns internally. Um, that has been a common theme throughout many of those reviews, and, and not just simply in terms of the specific types of safeguarding issues, but also about many other uh, non-safety um, related issues as well. And then coupled with that, I think has been the um, a breakdown of the so-called no compromise approach, which um, it, it of course alludes to as James mentioned, this idea of winning at all costs, which was metal targets and all the rest. And in fairness, I'm sure people are listening in and will say that has been recognised. UK sport yep. ruled, uh, rolled out a 12 year uh, a projection target programme rather than four years. Um, but um, probably in terms of the most recent um, scandal, which is still ongoing, which is, of course, British gymnastics. Um, we know all kinds of issues that arose from that in terms of um, the, the potential for that being uh, looked at internally and there was no confidence in that. Then in terms of a independent review, but it was co still commissioned by um, British Gymnastics and there was lack of confidence in that to such an extent that, as I understand it, there are dozens of anonymous uh, uh, complainants in, in terms of that space. So, so as much as I can from my own experience, absolutely understand that awareness and policies are in place. Many of the same themes that sadly go back decades are still in place now, which, which then leads me to the last point, and I'll stop here, because uh, I, I, I too could pass it on for a long time, um, is, <laughs> um, is that you know when we move on to structures domestically and internationally, uh, let's uh, you know doff our cap in the direction of Tani, who hasn't spoken yet, because back in 2017, and, and I reminded myself, and, and you, you worked on it as well, there were a series of 16 recommendations that were made in relation to safeguarding specifically. And, and Tani, you were commissioned by the then Minister of Sport, Tracy Crouch, and you handed it back uh, and you were thanked for it. Um, but the key recommendations have not been rolled into um, uh, any form of legislation, albeit there's one particular piece of legislation we might touch on, which is working its way through Parliament. Mm -hmm. but, but critically, in terms of perhaps a truly independent body, um, uh, such as an ombudsman, that is, that is a debate that's only sort of refinding its feet at the moment. So, um, so it's not it's not like we haven't looked closely at these. Uh, so, 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 John, and we'll bring Tani in now. <laughs> From what I hear from people in the space, is there any real appetite, right, for for there to be certain measures in place when essentially, if you and you were saying, Tani, that you don't, you feel that people, you know, just ignoring the problem, that if they acknowledge the problem, they're worried about, you know, from a govern government level and certain departments are worried about getting data that terrifies them in terms of what's going on, and therefore there's a lack of willingness to really grapple the issue for the reason that it may, you know, be. But, you know, despite it being the right thing to do, the findings might be so unpleasant for the government, at least, or for that for, um, you know, I'm not saying a, you know, a government or a particular individual there, but for some of these people, they don't want to be the person who is responsible for being perceived as being, um, you know, <clears throat> associated to loads of abuse increases in sport. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. I mean, what I experienced, there's loads of really good people in the system and people who want to bring about change. A lot of people don't know where to start. If I was being at my most cynical, I'd said there are a number of people in the system who weigh up the risk of um, opening Pandora's box and stuff that they know absolutely that exists and the impact and weighing that up against medals 
and children's desire and parents' desire to come in, play sport and attain the highest level. And, and I think there's a combination of those things that go on because every time there's a drug scandal in sport, you know, whether it's, you know, Lance Armstrong, you know, for about two or three days, I'm going, this is going to ruin cycling. And then it doesn't. And so I think when there's, you, you have really serious cases that come out, it doesn't destroy the sport or necessarily the, the people in it. So I think until we start seeing an impact on numbers and medals, um, it's difficult. And, and what John said exactly in terms of, you know, the medals, you know, I haven't got an issue with us wanting to win lots of medals. The debate is how many medals is enough? Mm. Do we want to be top of the medal table? And if we do, okay, that will take a significant financial investment and there's a personal cost. And then we have to have an open discussion. Are we prepared to pay that personal cost or not? But those are the discussions because they're really not nice to have. Um, you know, I've got no issue every last ounce of athletic talent being sucked out of an athlete before they retire off the programme. It's what we do with them afterwards. Um, and so I think people just bumble on and hope it's going to be OK and hope the next case, you know, and, you know, you replace gymnastics with any of the British, any of the governing body. It could have been any of them, really, uh, or any segment of any of those sports. And unless it gets to a weight of people just saying we are not going to let our children do that sport anymore. I'm not entirely sure what's going to change. Um, I it's, yeah. an, it's one of the uh, I was reading <clears throat> isn't this you know Teddy I think it's a, it's a great point you make isn't part of this though the, the very nature of sport you know that, that lends itself and it's going to be part of the conversation we're going to have this afternoon lends itself to a higher risk of exploitation and abuse right because of the power that James alluded to earlier that whole power dynamic and so I'm not sure if many of you read the article recently about a former Man United uh, Academy player who who basically said that he tried to injure his fellow teammate right because of the reason that he thought that it would get him out of the contention for his position and so you know when we're looking at you you know i've heard this you've now i think three of you have at least said this uh organizations don't know where to start so where do we start do we talk about the values of the organization the values of the sports themselves what where, what is the and then we got i have to say in knowledge that we've got eight questions that have come in so that's gonna be our last question for me and then we'll take questions but jenny did you want to tackle this where do we start can I suggest where we start? We start with the child and we don't start with the player and we don't start with the athlete and we, you know, we actually name the child. These are children we're talking mm. about. And for me, that is where we start. And we say, well, the, let's put it, if it was our child, if our child is, is, is a, on the elite talent pathway, how do we want our child to be cared for? And I always make the comparison when I'm speaking to people about schools. So, you know, um, if, I don't know, say a coach, for example, say in any sport, say a coach um, has the personal telephone number of their child athlete because it's easier, because perhaps something's going on with mum and dad and it's just easier to have that child's number. Um, and that coach is texting that child at night after the coaching sessions to perhaps arrange um, a coffee to talk about the strategy moving forward to get to county level. Let's say that's the example. If you take sport out of that and you put that in the educational context and my son's geography teacher was texting him on his mobile phone at 14 years old to arrange to meet for a coffee to discuss his strategy to get an A in his GCSE geography, everyone would, I'm hoping, <laughs> everyone would yeah. be concerned. And again, that's for me, we've got to take, I know we've got to talk about sport, we've got to talk about the children first and what, what, how do we create a safe environment for our children? And, you know, time and time again, um, not to criticize parents, but time and time again, parents refer to their children as player, the player refer to their children as the athlete. Well, let's go back to basics and let's remember that these are children first. So that's my suggestion. Where that's we a great point because I remember going to, um, I was a part of a, a private discussion. I can't say, won't say which organisation, but it was an owner of a football club talking about the transfer of minors in football. And I kept thinking, if you were talking about your child in the same way, they were basically saying how they should lower the age limit to transfer players, young players because of the reason they're worried about the big clubs getting the talent. And I thought, if you were talking about trading children 
if you use the word child, the same, exactly the same point. And I think there's a, it's a really so, so important, this point that you think you've raised. I think it's an excellent one that we should really consider quite strongly about the, the how we use this in the sector, the terminology. Great point, Jenny. Uh, Anne, sorry, you had something to say. Yeah, I was just, just going to come in and also pick up on what John had said earlier. I think it's really, really important when we're looking at transparent processes and making it easier for people to talk about what's happened to them, then both children and adult athletes and other people who may be experiencing abuse, officials and so on, mm. is we need to give people choices about how they can approach someone you might just want advice, you might just want some help, you might not necessarily want to report. So I think it's really important to differentiate between seeking help and reporting, because often people will want to test out before they actually report something to find out, is this somebody I can trust? What's going to happen if I do say something? Uh, and making that a much, much easier thing for people to do, which is why I think you need to have both options within sports and outside of sports and be be signposted to places, independent places, whereas some people will want to talk to their coach about what's happening. Sometimes they wanted to talk about things that are happening outside of the sport, but that's impacting them in sport. So I think that's really, really important and to have a range of options. I'd also like to pick up on something that a couple of the, the, the members of the legal profession have said before. We have too much of an adversarial system at the moment that doesn't work for children it doesn't work on these sensitive issues very few cases actually go forward into criminal courts and then they're left for the sports to deal with um, and I think we need to look much more creatively at how we can have a, a child and adult centered approach to dealing with things that are going wrong you know it's really interesting that sorry um you it. it's, re it's really interesting because when um you know obviously being a, a a child protection lawyer within criminal justice system you know that was what I dealt with all the time and the officers that dealt with the children and interviewed the children um, had completed a really intensive course and they were qualified to interview children and that's the difficulty in sports isn't it is that then mm. these cases are coming back in for example I you know either the CPS and police feel that there's not enough evidence or maybe the um, the complainant maybe supports an investigation internally but doesn't support a police investigation they might be the two scenarios that it comes back in um, and the the people that who who are interviewing those children um, perhaps aren't as experienced or, or um, don't have the qualifications or don't know where to start talking about that quote you know where yeah. to start um, and that that's really important because from an evidence gathering point of view for, for the sport that's really important but it's also important Firstly, for the child and the experience of the child, you know, how, that could, you know, if they've been through a, a period of abuse or what, whatever that that looks like, it, it's a really important um, moment to to be able to sit down with an adult who understands the the, the procedures, and um, that that for me is is and, really important. There. And, and 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 so, James, did you have something you wanted to? No, no, I'm, 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 <laughs> I wasn't sure if you're, you're, you're waiting to jump in. Um, the, the, it's interesting because, you know, I like to think, you know, that I'm a, a relatively compassionate and empathetic person, but, you know, re repeatedly I've, I've not in this arena, not uh, necessarily been as um, understanding of some of the issues thinking, well, all good intentions, right? All well intentioned. And I've spoken to a bunch of uh, different people, various victims and survivors uh, and others who um, uh, have been incredibly helpful and reading various public reports of these very brave individuals and listening to them. And it would seem to me that what you're saying is, Jenny, that, that you can have very well-meaning people Absolutely. in the sports organisation who are, and I think you mentioned it, I think you phrased it in a really lovely way as well uh, on the call, the prep call, which was, it's not fair on, on the actual, as much as it's not obviously not right for the child, it's also not fair on an individual who hasn't been prepared to do that. that. Remember, yes, and I do yeah. yeah. So Tani. Sorry, Jenny. Sorry. I was going to say, if you look at the structure of the governing bodies, the welfare officer might not be full time. Uh, you, you look at them within the structure of the organisation, that'd be quite low. How do you take on, so with the culture of fear that exists, mm. so people are really unwilling to, to make a complaint, they, they might you know, make a phone call and moan about things, but actually physically writing it down is always really difficult to do. And, you know, I've had athletes say to me, well, I can't do that because it will affect my position on the squad or the team mm. or whatever. You know, I had one person say to me, you know, what they experienced was the price they paid for making the GB team. And they made that decision at quite a young age. 
uh, you know, you took them 14 and then just said, I'm, I was willing to, to tolerate. And you go, wow. Um, so, you know, how do you take on a performance director who's employed to bring that magic fairy dust to deliver the medals, which is then the next four years of the cycle? So, so, so it's a power you, imbalance, isn't it? Uh, most athletes don't even know the complaints process or how to raise a complaint. You know, there's too many squad contracts that say if you've got an issue with a coach or and, and coaches are in a really difficult position as well. But if you've got an issue, go, go to one of the other coaches who's probably the best mate of the coach that you want to raise a complaint about. So I've had some really young athletes at 11, 12 years old saying, you know, don't rock the boat. Don't raise your head above the parapet. One 14 year old said to me, when my sport asks for loyalty, they mean compliance. 14 year old. Yeah. Uh, can, can, right can, into them. can I ask a question, Sean, of Tani, really? How, how do you deal with that fear that these athletes are going to have it? And, and this is precisely the theme of the case that I did years ago, you know, of things that have happened years ago. How do you, how do you deal with the fear of a 12, 13, 14 year old that if he or she says anything, it's going to affect their, their ambitions? I, I mean, it, for, for me, on there's, there's several levels. On a personal level, I had people come and tell me some absolutely traumatic, horrible things. And you go, what do you want to do? And they went, nothing. I just needed to tell somebody who understood the system. And you go, okay, so that's the way. Um, I, I think if, if there are a level of sport where they could go to the British Athletes Commission, sometimes a lot of it, they just want somebody to talk to, somebody who understands the weird nature of selection policies, uh, someone who can you can just help them stand back and, and look at it um, sometimes it's actually just finding other people in the sport where there's a collective action uh, and that's where some of the success has been but ultimately it's really easy for someone in performance to sports say oh, there's not a culture for somebody can come and talk to me at any point they want yeah, yeah um, that, that just and that unfortunately you know when we talk about an ombudsman and things like yeah. it's just so easy to bat it away and we don't need it it's all um, right it's, it's just easy to knock it away I think also the, just to echo that you need the importance of confidential helplines as well, where people can. So like you've got the NSPCC's child line, yeah. you've got other other lines like that, and the, the, that difference between help and reporting again to to differentiate the two things. So um, I think the British Athletes uh, Commission helpline and, and stuff like that is really really important. So you know I can just go somewhere and chat this through and talk it through. I don't even need to say who I am just to help me think through. I'm as a Tony said, I might just need help today because I really feel like I can't take this anymore. Um, I must admit that we, we, I had a conversation, I won't say who with, but um, someone approached me for some help on something uh, internationally. And I, I was unclear on who to go to. Right. And we were, and I spoke to some other people who you thought would be best placed to know who to go to. And then they were like, mm, actually, I'm not sure who would be responsible for this, mm. right. And this is this dimension. Um, now, one of the things that we want from this panel is we, 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 I think we all acknowledge that sport could do better then, right. So it's doing better than it was, but can still do much, much better. Um, we've got 14 questions uh, that I think it, uh, you know, mm. the purpose of this panel was to be useful and helpful to people. So I think if we can answer some of these questions, I think hopefully that means everyone will be empowered to to go off and make the, some changes independently and as well collectively um, but also as the panelists I'd love you to think about in terms of um, you know what either action or what things you would like us to see <laughs> how, how can we bring around these helplines reporting confidential um, you know helplines the reporting requirements the help and support what does that really look like and then how can we you know create this culture of accountability more broadly um, I'll just leave that percolating in the background I think that's going to be part of the theme of these questions um, now forgive me in advance as again everyone knows who's joined into others I always get people's names wrong so someone's gonna I'm apologizing already for this uh, but anyway Andrew Brenton I can say that one perfectly um, uh, I'm currently researching on this area for WSA in Wales. Um, does the panel think that a sexual offences sports coaches bill goes far enough to protect young athletes? Should the law be extended to include managers, team selectors and other significant figures in sport? So it might be useful to people. Uh, I'm not sure who's best placed to know about that bill. Who wants to describe what the bill is first and then say if that, they think that goes far enough? I've prosecuted quite a few people under the Sexual Offences Act, so I'll have a go. Um, so um, just to put it in context, if anyone isn't aware um, about the position of trust, um, we, we currently don't have a, a criminal offence that covers 
sports coaches. So it will cover something like a teacher. I always like that teacher analogy. So um, just to put people's mind at rest before I answer the question, um, there are many other criminal offences that cover the behaviour. And I think it's quite important to highlight that at first. It doesn't mean that there's a gap in the law in that coaches cannot be prosecuted because there are lots of offences under the Sexual Offences Act. I think the difficulty is, is um, coaches are working daily um, with those children and quite rightly they should be uh, taken under that, that, um, that auspice of uh, the person in position of trust. So in relation to um, the question, which I've, I can't see now. So, sorry, sorry. Is, um, is sorry. sorry, that's my fault. So it says, um, uh, in the question was, does the bill go far go enough? Far so, enough, yeah. To protect young enough. athletes. Well, I suppose the, the answer is where do you stop? Because you can you could you could cover any any adult who has any con contact with a child is in a position of trust because adults should care about children. But, so Jenny, just to interrupt, sorry, sorry, but say for example, we talked to, only because we talked about this uh, earlier, we had a conversation around money laundering, right? And provisions in place. And when I used to work in a law firm as a credit controller, I was briefed that if I uh, had suspicions of, on, on money laundering offences, on some financial crime that I could be ultimately res responsible for that and criminal action could be brought against me if I didn't do my job properly, right? I think the question was asked to like, senior officials. Right, I, I'm going to distinguish that, Sean. What I'm going to say is mm. um, that's probably more in relation to a duty to report um, and whether we have a legal duty to mm. report. Um, just in relation to the question is more about should we um, cover managers and things like that. And again, I, I probably repeating myself, I'm not sure how far we go with it because we could technically cover every single position of, of anyone, whoever comes into contact with children. So I think it's a good start. Um, it probably doesn't go far enough, um, but certainly... Does, does it Does it raise, sorry, does it raise the, again, talking about boards though, if there was this position of trust, does it raise the more importance at the board level because it gets more acknowledged? Or I think what it does is it acknowledges to... to, to you know, the public to everybody and to the people that are working in sport and um, that coaches are on that list. Um, so you think it would be a good thing then? To, to, oh, to... Good, yeah, it's absolutely a good thing. But it's just in I, terms of I... limit. Yeah, go for it. Can I, can I just come in as well? I mean, this has been a very strong lobbying issue from NSPCC for a long time. Tani put this in the review report as well. I think there does need to be a broader definition because to the child, it doesn't matter who that person is, that they're volunteer, that they're paid. What matters is the ability to groom that child for abuse um, rather than it just being fixed um, uh, uh, headings because you know somebody could be a PE teacher one minute and a coach the next minute yeah. and a volunteer and something else. That's not what's important to that child. It's how they're abusing that position um, to, to be able to groom them for abuse. So Tanya, did you? Yeah, and, and it's that power of sport. So, you know, is everybody in elite sport vulnerable? No, but there's a vulnerability about everybody in who's trying to, wherever you are on the pathway, if you have the aspiration, whether you're 12 or 20 and you're trying to compete at the highest level and it's the power and the grooming that happens. So, you know, it starts at, do you want to make the team? I can help you and then if the person challenges or a parent over here is like, I was offering an extra coaching session so for me the positions of trust legislation is quite important because it lays a marker in the sand and this is where sport you know it, it loves to say it's different when it suits it and that's kind of quite an all-encompassing for but you know oh well sport sport's different so we don't need it well actually I think sports proved that it does need it because um yeah, and it's probably quite true. I, I married my, my my husband was a fellow athlete he became my coach um you know we, we have to think about those relationships for me where I see where I, I'm really worried is inappropriate relationships between young women in sports and older male coaches because that tends to be it doesn't it's not that way in dance and in other sort of places but it tends to be men in positions of, of power and the, the secret relationships I've got a real issue with that um, that's uh, that's Tony. That's one of the reasons why we've got um, um, uh, the panel this afternoon with Khalida Pop, uh, Popel, um, you know, the Afghan women player uh, and captain of the women's football team. I'm afraid it's, exa it's exactly, yeah. uh, and I don't know the full details. We'll find out more about it later. But I believe from what's been out in the at least in the press, though, yeah. that's exactly the type of scenario, right? Someone having control. Uh, um, so can I just add one thing? Because what what yeah, I absolutely. never ever want to hear again, and I hear it way too much, is when something happens. And there's, whether it's a sexual relationship or whether it's group or whatever it is, the, the reasons, 
that coach has won lots of medals. It's okay because the coach has won lots of medals. So what's the no. price of a medal? Yeah. So well, that's, can a coach that's... harass someone? Can they stalk someone? To, to tell me what the price is. That's you know, and, and been used way too much. Mm. Sorry, Jenny. Saying that sounds like criminal behaviour to me. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so next question. Thank you. Um, Sam Little, um, where do you feel survivors of abuse get the best chance of getting acknowledgement, inquiries and investigations or criminal or civil, uh, sorry, investigations, uh, criminally, criminal and civil appear not to deliver the outcomes many are looking for? This acknowledgement is so important in allowing individuals to move forward. Has there been any experience of restorative justice being used in gaining acknowledgement? John, you look like you wanted to say something well uh, yeah I, I think this is this is a really interesting question in terms of you know when issues that we're discussing have been un uncovered what is the best route that, that that survivors should go down and if we go right back to the beginning of our conversation this afternoon James discussed the cases that he's been involved in which ha have been incredibly costly taken a long time and um, even though there was no evidence to um, contradict, as I understand it, the allegations that were made. There wasn't even an acknowledgement from the particular club that you referred to. Uh, and I know when it came to costs, one of the issues that led to indemnity costs in that case is that um, there was not even, um, as I understand it, the smallest suggestion of an acknowledgement of, of what had taken place had taken place, which really reflects terribly in terms of the culture of professional football in that particular uh, club. Um, then on the other hand, I kind of move on to an alternative route, which is the kind of route that I typically get involved in, which are internal reviews. Uh, well, we've, got, we've had Tanny's review. Um, we've got the ongoing independent review into child sex abuse, which um, in fairness has been delayed as well because of the ongoing criminal uh, allegations. And then we've also got the inquiry into child sex abuse at the moment, which covers sport. Um, none of these processes um, finish or conclude quickly. Um, but what they do afford, uh, and this reflects some of the comments that Anne and Jenny have made and, and Tani as well, they afford a route which is outside sport, which uh, hopefully um, tick the boxes of, of independence and to a certain extent, confidentiality. Uh, and the one thing that I will always remember about probably the first review I was part of, it was about engendering trust in the process. So people understood that if they spoke to us in terms of um, their allegations, that they would not be fed back immediately to the sporting body. Uh, and then once they realized that that was exactly um, what we were going to do in terms of keeping things confidential, then more and more people came to us. And I can see, you know, Sam, in terms of the BAC, I think we are already seeing that even though people will always criticize sport as being a very small world, about the purse strings being somehow linked back to the very bodies that these, the, the BAC and others are meant to be independent from, they have to get their resources from somewhere. And, and um, I think that argument is, is fairly futile. So, so so, 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 John, sorry to interrupt. Uh, I want to try and bring James in, given that you're referring to the cases he was involved with to get his opinion on that. But also, so, so, just in short, though, you're saying that, you know, independent, having some form of independent, you know, with the limitation of where they get their funding from, but having some in the form of independent investigation and body that you can trust is the most, is the, is the, uh, is the place that, that, that people should have faith in. This can be dealt with internally on the, on the basis of uh, internal uh, procedures, be they formal or informal, in a way that is satisfactory. That is ideal. I mean, that happens in workplaces up and down the country. But sadly, we just have seen many examples where that simply has not happened. Um, okay. And then we move on to the processes that I'm, I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, uh, ultimately, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think it's key that, that what we are all saying is that um, individuals have a way of obtaining redress and so, there can be barriers put up in front of them, which sadly, in terms of uh, uh, court proceedings, there can often be. 
so so james can i get your view on that and jenny i'd love to get your view on the other what we see as john said what we see in uh or maybe james you can address this as well I mean, in I, other I, sectors i agree with, agree with i think with all of that um there's no there's no magic solution here i don't think um and all of the ways in which um uh, complainants survivors when they finally have the courage to, to, to disclose what's happened to them sometimes many years later are, I'm afraid, not very satisfactory, um, be it the civil claim route with all its delays and all its costs and all the entrenchment of the lawyers posturing and so forth, whether it's the inquiries, whether they're internal inquiries or external ones, and the, sometimes the perception there that they're not really independent, or whether it's the criminal process. and. Um, and whether that actually lead, where that leads, it sometimes leads to a criminal trial, but more often than not, sadly, because of the rules of, of evidence and the burden of, of proof, the standard of proof, um, cases can't be brought. Um, I, I just like to take it back a step, just if I may. Um, what is, I find so depressing, uh, particularly in the case of survivors who suffered um, uh, long-term, very serious psychiatric damage as a result of what happened to them when they were in their early teens, is that they say time and again, I'm worse now, My, the symptoms are worse than they were before they disclosed the abuse. And I, I just find that is so depressing. And that's something that we need to try to address. I'm not sure how, because mm. um, if somebody comes, if, if somebody's thinking of taking that brave step as you know, all those footballers did two or three years ago, following on from uh, disclosures made by Andy Woodward and, and others, um, uh, and they then find that they're worse, that they really haven't got any, to use that expression, closure as a result, then there's something wrong somewhere. And of course, none of this will happen su uh, successfully or effectively, if that is the case. Could I also just pick up on that? And I'd be really interested in your views. I mean, I think a, a lot of the lawyers that people have within their sports that aren't necessarily used to dealing with these types of cases yeah. and I think one of the worst things when people come forward is that um, board members for instance may be may be told to hide behind their lawyers who say don't say anything when actually what's wanted is an acknowledgement and I'm sorry and we'll do something about it not hiding behind um, the lawyers some of whom really don't have this expertise so I'd be really interested in your views on that. I, I, I... And I think that's exactly right. Um, I think I would say this, of course, because I act for claimants, but the claimants' lawyers t tend to have much more experience of dealing with this because they're dealing with it all of the time. And, and they have that face-to-face -face contact with, um, with their clients all of the time. But there, there are occasions, um, I hope I'm not speaking out of term, when, when one feels that those dealing with it, that lawyers dealing with it on the other side, just have absolutely no conception about the effect of writing some of the things that they do write um, upon, these, upon these people who've ha finally had the courage to, to, to report what happened to them sometimes a long time is, ago. Is that, a, is that an issue of training, Jenny? Sorry. James, I, I'm just picking up on what James and Anne has said. Um, I, I don't think it's an issue of training. I think it's an issue of um, you know, priorities. Contract lawyers, for example, you know, contract lawyers have to be instructed to draft the contract to take on a professional sports person or you know what whatever that contract looks like you, you've then got ip lawyers so intellectual property lawyers um you've got regulatory lawyers there are lots of different types of lawyers that you, you might find um in in a sport yet there are, is a distinct lack of child protection lawyers um, and i know that one of the recommendations in the geeky report um, that came out I think was it last year or the year before I'm, I apologize not knowing the date and that obviously was in relation to the inquiry into Chelsea Football Club one of the key recommendations was to um, make sure that when clubs or sports are dealing with these kinds of issues they take some advice from a, a lawyer who understands about trauma and about welfare because they will be, provide a better service to those survivors because they respect um, you know the the perhaps not respect but that's probably not the right word yeah, but they yeah. are more aware of what the consequences are because they have dealt with it in a professional manner a professional on a professional basis um for, for however many years before so you know for example working at the current prosecution service that was my 
you know, my daily work was to deal with um, survivors of abuse, whether that be non-recent or, or recent. And, and perhaps it's the emotional intelligence, I don't know whether that's probably the, the correct word, but the emotional intelligence that comes with that and the sensitivity. Um, I myself, I'm not speaking out of term, but sometimes you don't see that within um, a, a more commercial yeah. and corporate well, realm. Can I, can I jump in just as a practical yes. example um, of the kind of um, uh, push and pull factors that um, you've alluded to and Jenny as well, which is the use of um, so-called gagging clauses or confidentiality uh, uh, clauses within um, compromise agreements. And commercially, um, they make a lot of sense because they draw a line in the sand there's often a payment made underneath, uh, under them, um, and but in in consideration for that payment, there's of course going to be all kinds of uh, bells and whistles, including uh, confidentiality. Um, and I, I've seen that in some sports I've looked at. It's um, it was an example in the Chelsea case, Jenny, you mentioned. But if that means that these issues are then swept under the carpet. Mm and the perpetrators are allowed to continue as before, then I'm afraid that is not abiding by the duty of care that we are all alluding to, which is the fundamental basis of everything we're discussing. And sadly, that has happened in a number of cases. Um, and, and one of the recommendations that we made in, in one sport was, um, we cannot criticize you for entering into these agreements. But what we can criticize you from doing is not joining the dots when you're entering into 50 of these agreements over the course of two years, all in relation to the same person. Why haven't you done anything uh, about that? Uh, and that is where, and ask your question, lawyers are brought in, um, uh, not simply to look at the, the, the victim and survivors, but more often than not to protect the reputation of the sport and the individuals who are sitting at the top of the sport. Uh, and I absolutely won't name names, but it's fair to say that um, in public, people are all smiles and, and full of praise for independent reviewers. Uh, you can imagine that behind the scenes, it is not necessarily the same, uh, far from it. And that rather reflects exactly what you're saying. But what I will always say to people in those situations, which is, you either address it now or it will come out. What would you rather? That you have, have, are part of a cover-up or you are the person who actively tried to deal with the issue? Which one is worse? Uh, and, and obviously that's a rhetorical question, but um, uh, that, John, that addresses your point, I think. Um, thank you. Um, uh, it's such a complicated area and such an important area. Um, I'm, I'm, we've got 15 questions that I'd love us to try and get through just because I think some of them are going to be very important and pertinent to those individuals who are working in the space. Um, so forgive me if I'm a bit um, curt, they say, we're cutting people off. But on the point that John was saying, it seems to me then the issue is to, to, to solve us. It's a systemic problem. How do, you solve, how do you create a system in which there is no option? Like there's accountability, there's reporting. So even if it is anonymized, there's some data that's going somewhere to flag that there's a problem, even if it's not necessarily uh, breaching those uh, private agreements. Um, Renuka Ramdas, good day to you all. To what extent has governing bodies outside of implementing policies moved away from the nonchalant attitude to investigating reports? Have the various studies have any impact on the change in attitudes? And can we get a quick answer on this if possible? Jenny, you look like you, look like you were... Uh, I, well, I'd say that the, there's there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes and a, a massive acknowledgement that that system still needs to, to change. Um, it, it, it's it's a whole culture shift. Mm. Would um, you say then? It's, sorry, it's, it's sport specific. Is in like you know the, the certain sports of uh, from certain certain reports, and maybe Tanya, you can come in on this. Certain you know sports are, are embracing it, whereas others are being. Uh, as you said at the beginning, burying their heads in the sand a little bit. 
Do you mean me, Sean? Sorry. I you first and then yeah. Tanny. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, um, I, I can only speak really for, for football and for the EFL. Mm. Um, and I'm not speaking on their behalf. I'm speaking as an no. independent person who has observed, you know, the, the working practices over a couple of years. And they are there um, as a regulatory body. And so with that regulatory function comes um, consequences. And so there are consequences um, if football clubs do not comply with their regulatory obligations. So the, the, there are things that can be done. Um, so th things like um, fitness to, to have the, so they have license to practice mm. of an academy, and that could be taken, I'm not saying it will do, but it could be taken, the potential mm. is you could take that away um, if the, NGB doesn't feel that the staff are, um, you know, either qualified so, so, enough or, or the knowledge, you know, the, the system. So, Jenny, sorry, to go back to the question, though, so, and so forgive me just because I'm just conscious of time. Um, do you think there is, well, I think, it, would you say that in football, because of the reports and it's obviously ongoing reports, there has been driving positive change and have been, in, uh, yes or no? As in, has it been? It, it has driven positive change. Right, perfect. Tanny, Outside of football mm. and other sports, what do you think? Yeah, yes, no? What, what, no. Um, what DCMS wanted was this sport's brilliant, this one's rubbish, everyone else is in between. Some sports have really embraced my work and reviews, some haven't. Some have done reviews which have never gone public, which is amazing that they've kept it quiet. Um, you know, UK sport have talked for years. If governing bodies don't do this, don't, we'll cut their funding. Well, they they've never done that. They've cut funding for other reasons. Um, and... Uh, even relatively recently, I had an athlete say to me in their cycle review, they fed back to an anonymous survey what other people have been saying. And the head coach took to them one side and said, you write that in your survey again, you're out. So the trust, uh, some people have got better at hiding. It's, it's I, I can't say who, but someone who was involved in a, in a report that was public pub, published publicly said, though, that they, their uh, uh, view on this was that um, the, these type of investigations, the report should be made public, like when there are these these reports, so that everyone can join the dots, as opposed to, as you were saying, Tony, some having them private, some having them public. Their view is like, take ownership of it and, and make it. Is there a view on that in terms of these independent reports? Can I just get a quick take? Tony, do you think it should be pub they should be made public or? Um, well, I'm just going to just jump in to, uh, on that question because uh, to a certain extent, you learn through your experiences. And I will not take on an independent review without having an agreement at the outset that my report is going to be published uh, and um, uh, ideally in full. Great, thank you. Ta Jenny? No, no, I was just agreeing with John. No, 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 no. So you agree it should be public, though? Again, oh, yes. So we all agreed. So everyone's, yeah. A, yeah, right, great. Okay, that's a better way. Sorry, <laughs> bad, bad I chairmanship, I guess. So. I, I had people who were terrified to come to Parliament and be seen to be meeting me. I had people who asked that their name didn't even go in my diary. Wow. So, yes, I yeah, totally yeah. agree with John, stuff should be public, mm. but we've got to, because no whistleblowers never come out of it well. It's an excellent point, mm. Tony. Um, Andrew Brenton has said, could board level engagement with safeguarding be a fiduciary duty under section 172 of the Companies Act? Jenny, I'll take, go straight to you, you on this. To, um, ask a company lawyer. <laughs> John, John, uh, James. John used to be, used to be uh, in, in banking, so. <laughs> Sounds like a really good idea, but I'm afraid it, great, so far yeah. as the Companies Act is concerned, you'll have to ask John. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily, funnily enough, in the, um, I'm not, this wasn't a safeguarding review, but um, it was a government's review. Um, the UK Athletics Review started off with various pages of the Companies Act uh, and fiduciary duties that are there. Look, the fundamental point is that um, any board director has to act in the best interests of their sport. And um, that does not mean looking after their own personal self-interest. In fact, it would be a breach of the fiduciary duties to put your own personal self-interest ahead of the sport. And so by definition, and that includes the well-being, because we know through the common law or regulations um, or various forms of statute, that that includes a safe system of work and, uh, uh, and um, a competent... So, so, so John, sorry, just because of time, the answer then being is, in theory, just as a company, they should have the responsibility. You've got to be careful with barristers, <laughs> the silver the tongue. Um, uh, right. Um, sorry, John. Sorry. Because yes. uh, we've got a question for Tani uh, from Manuel uh, Sierra. Um, hi, everyone. This is a wonderful theme of the conference. 
um, questions for the Baroness. Uh, um, as a sports lawyer, which works with uh, disabled sports, um, what are the main risks that exist in Paralympic world that need safeguard? Um, one of the biggest risks is intentional manipulation of classification. Um, so in terms of uh, getting people into the wrong classes, winning medals on the back of it, that affects so many things, you know, people not being able to compete, um, it, it skews the medal winning. Um, and currently there's really limited options that the International Paralympic Committee have in terms of um, banning athletes or people who do it. So I think it should be brought under rules more like WADA, which is not perfect in any stretch of the imagination, but um, there, there should be um, stricter rules in terms of what happens to countries that, that do it. I think Ali Jawad is going to be doing his PhD on, on yeah. that topic, right? Which is yeah. you know, yeah, great, brilliant. great work. So if you're interested in that, you should reach out to him. He's brilliant. Um, and can, Ali, I, can I... Can I also just flag up, it, it's not so much what vulnerability comes with a disability, it's more how we make disabled people more vulnerable, how society does. We know that for children generally, disabled children are much more vulnerable to being abused for a whole raft of reasons. And there are a lot of people in sport who don't understand what they need to do to ensure that anybody with a protected characteristic is properly protected within their sports. Um, there's a, there are additional dependencies, for instance, simply to have access to sport and to get out of the house if you don't comply with things. This might be your only activity. So those people, you know, you need to make sure that those safeguards are in place. Um, and so I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but um, the one thing that I thought on that point, because I think it's, it's again, I love, I love that approach and that's something positive that we can do in order as a group and as people working in the state to, to, to look, more, look more forward thinking rather than waiting for something to happen and looking that way, you just go, right, what ownership can we take to be a better place to deal with this? And there was a great point raised by Alex Richards, who said, um, not all, all those, and it made it to an earlier point, so forgive me, Alex, for, for coming back to it so late, but uh, not all those people, uh, not all those who are looking to find redress uh, looking through criminal proceedings or investigations, some want to work with the sport to improve things for the future. And I think that's a, an absolutely great point to make that there's an opportunity as well, and it should be opportunity given. There's many people uh, who, um, you know, former Man City players and others who are doing some fantastic work um, to, to try to make, make things better. So thank you for raising that point. And sorry, I didn't come to it earlier. Marsha Lewis, um, it, it is also time for review for safeguarding regulations to address the negative impact of the of the release of young athletes by sports organisations following uh, the suicide. I have to say, actually, on this point, I've done some stuff with. I was at a, an event with the, the uh, uh, UNICEF, and I was lobbying, and I would lobby for that they stop using the term "release players," like as if you release someone from prison, and actually say you graduate players. In uh, I think at the Right to Play Academy, they say that you graduate from the academy, and so it's a positive thing. But just my two cents on that is that the, the term technology and the, the the baggage that goes with being released is like you're released you're discarded and comes back to Jenny's point I think on treating the child or a young person or any person as a human being as opposed to uh, just an asset I don't know if anyone else has got a view on that Jenny did you have a view on that yeah I suppose it's twofold um, looking at the, the treatment of the child whilst they are um, within the, the the club and then when they are moving on um, I think that the conversation has certainly turned the past sort of 18 months into looking at how the mental health of the children, athletes, are, are um, supported better. So a lot of training is going on in relation to um, people becoming mental health first aiders. Uh, that's certainly something that I've seen um, a massive increase in in football recently um, and perhaps also something that will be used moving forward is looking at the other skills that the children have and um, not just sports skills but you know giving them opportunities to maybe if they're creative or you know they like drawing maybe letting them go and, and have, have some kind of opportunities like that to maybe widen and broaden their skill set because as we all know not everybody gets in the first team um, and, this, and I, Jenny, this is where the, the, the it's interesting because the world's aligned, obviously, tennis due to care review, right? If you really care about the people who participate in your sport, right? And all the data shows you that they the that mantra that well players and a lot of the people working player development is better people make better players, right? Absolutely. And that right. And yet there seems to be this disconnect. And this is one of the things I find really interesting, hence why I was so keen to get Tanny and John on this. Uh, this call, which is this broader connection to, to overall performance in sport, that there's this seems to be this narrative that 
you know, we're evolved that the more abusive that you are towards individuals, the more they, they perform, right? Rather than actually, if you care for individuals from a coaching perspective and give them interest outside of sport, and this is this whole uh, duty to look after and again, in Tally's report into what happens post-career and planning for that. I think it's very interesting. Coming to the next question, Florian Kirchner. What should a permanent safe sport institution look like? And I guess there comes a question is, should there be a, one domestically and then obviously safe sport international, but more broadly, mm -hmm. and I think, and you had mentioned that uh, there was a call for an investigatory body to do with this internationally. Maybe I'll go to you first. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I know that um, FIFA have recently put out a call for an independent entity to receive and investigate cases. I mean, there's a whole host of issues around that that we, that we don't have the time to cover, but there are significant issues in, in terms of people moving across borders and many, many countries not having the capacity at the moment to know how to deal with and respond to reports of concerns at all. So there's a need for help and capacity building through a body like that, as well as taking care of those issues for them where there is no capacity in place. But there's a wider issue for me about how that links to research and evidence and in, in, including our knowledge base. Um, that absolutely needs to be built into any independent body that we learn from what we're doing and that we share knowledge and, and experience. So um, in, in right. an ideal world, you might have a global hub and national um, bodies as well. And also, and uh, Johnny Killigan has also mentioned this, but I know that Loughborough has many, I think there's a bunch of other academics. I'm not sure if the panellists have time, but you could always put links in to the bottom if you want. And obviously, Jenny, you're doing a lot of stuff on education. Uh, it's probably worth in this forum, if we get time before we go, if there's any uh, useful uh, surveys or other stuff that you guys are all involved with, or actually, if you provide it to us, we'll send it out. Um, but if you did want to put it in, the, if you get the opportunity to do it now, I know it's difficult when you're speaking. If you did want to put it into the chat, of course, feel free to do that because I'm sure everyone will find it useful. Jenny, so you like you had wanted to uh, uh, sure. oh, John? Mind something? if I just jump in on that, on that yeah. point? Because um, I, I will always remember somebody I know quite senior in International Federation being asked about their opinion about the independent reviews that are, that are taking place here and the inqui inquiries and the reports. And um, I, I asked them, how is this all perceived across the world in terms of what's happening here in the state of sort of evolution about now looking at the process and not just simply at the outcomes? And their response was illuminating. Um, they said, um, uh, we've discussed this with people across the globe and they're laughing at us because they don't understand why we're doing this when we are doing so well on the medal table. And um, I just thought that in terms of culture, um, we're talking about a lot of culture here domestically, but we have got to the stage here of developing processes and reviews and having bodies in place that do not exist in many places and jurisdictions around the world. And yet the very same issues, if not more acute, are taking place. And, and, and you mentioned FIFA, I know the UN are looking into some of these issues as well. Uh, but these are global issues and um, the, state, the, the, posi the position we're in at the moment is actually using and harnessing some of the experiences and expertise we have now to assist others to develop uh, similar, uh, um, similar approaches. John, um, obviously, though, we've seen also that, unfortunately, in this, it seems like just in life, but the, the human characteristics, right, we deal with... Mm -hmm uh extreme scenarios right we respond to these extreme events and obviously we saw usa gymnastic and then a reform being passed there as well and it seems that obviously there's been you got south korea you've got afghanistan you've got haiti it just seems so worldwide that you said this that at some point surely surely there does need to be some international body because the one of the problems being with uh, people, particularly uh, abusive people, is that they window shop. Right? And again, people who work in this space, and many of them, funny enough, have asked questions. People who have helped educate me, like Kath Bennett and others, uh, will say that these people who are abusive, they find the path of least resistance. Basically, they 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 almost like push on, like find which door is the one that's open, and then they'll go into that door. And so, if we're dealing with sport as a as a global and international body, at some point, we surely have to say that if if we leave anywhere that is unchecked is going to be likely that that place that has got no supervisory capacity, has no investigatory capacity, is going to be the most exposed and most vulnerable. And that just seems to me to be, that if we know that, if that is true, and we don't do anything about it, then surely we're all responsible for, for what happens. 
Oh. I think also governments, I mean, one of the things that's really important is the Kazan Action Plan and the sport, uh, the SDGs for the next 10 years are going to include the need for governments to report on a number of measures related to child safeguarding in sport, as well as violence against women and girls. And that is the first time that that has happened. We're now obviously seeing ASWAF requiring uh, safeguarding reporting being included in governance reviews. And obviously, I think for many, many international federations, this needs to be strengthened, the need for this to be a core part of good governance. But we need everybody to work together. It's governments, it's sports organisations, it's helping organisations and NGOs, as well then, as... Yep. So, so do you think then the human rights, the push towards more human rights is also enab enabling that in that sense, in terms of like focusing the yep. and raising the attention of, of reporting? Yeah, that's a massive issue. And I think one of the biggest changes in the last couple of years is seeing this work as a whole um, approach to child rights and human rights in sport, which you would never have heard anybody talking about only a few years ago. And I, I'm very, very keen to ensure that all integrity issues are also looked at together and the intersectionalities between the abuse issues um, that we've heard about and other forms of abuse that happen by how people are treated, as Tanya and I, you know, come, covered all of those areas in the in the duty of care review people were traumatized by a whole range of issues i've got a question for that that wait to uh, andrew cook who's uh, works in esports i'm not sure if it's i'm sure he spoke he's a fanatic so uh, he spoke earlier in the in the in, in the week um making safeguard everyone's responsibility emphasizes how important it is to get the introduction process right and structural risk controls are 25% of that process, as you acknowledge. Rolling out that policy does not itself drive change. How do organisations set up right to address behaviour at scale? What key behavioural indicators do you look for um, or boards should be looking for in assessment of risk readiness? I thought, well, great question. Who wants to tackle that? In, um, and so I should say, if, if attendees are willing to stay on and you've asked a question, and if there's, and I know the speakers are very busy, you know, if, if you need to go, then just tell me you need to go. But if you're happy to ask the rest of the answer, the rest of the questions, I won't answer any more than have been asked now. But if you're happy to stay on, I know you've all got busy schedules. For, you happy to stay on? Five five minutes. Okay, we'll try and run through it. Yeah. So on that one, how do you do with it at scale? Do you want to? Um... For, for boards, sorry, do you want, Jenny. Well, you answer. And first. Uh, so, so for boards, I think every board needs to assess what are the risks to sport generally. Well, I mean, abuse is a societal issue, but what are the mm. issues in sport? And then look at their own sport and go, and what are the particular areas of risk for our sport that we need to address and put those in their risk, reg risk register? Jenny? Yeah, and I think it was just taking the point about, um, it, you know, it's not just about good policy to um, have everyone's responsibility being safeguarding it's actually in statutory guidance and so you know it's our legal responsibility as well as our moral responsibility and it I suppose it's just a drip drip effect you can you know one if you keep repeating the same phrase eventually everyone will get it and it's just everyone working together really to continue that 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 work and whether it is at board level or whether it's an induction of a, of a caretaker um, it doesn't matter the message is the same Thank you. Um, we've got uh, Annie Ratu, uh, Rutu, uh, who says, uh, do the panellists think that as much that the much needed efforts to safeguard children um, hinder the realisation of wider children's rights, for example, the right to be heard? So uh, a great point, I think. So she's basically saying in the focus to, to, to try and protect them, you're, you know, you were talking about giving them other activities and other opportunities. Do we do we uh, become too singular in focus and not look at it broadly? You kind of addressed it, Jenny, in, in that wider point. But did anyone want to tackle that or have any views on that? We're actually about to do a study with um, the Centre for Sport and Human Rights on uh, the broad reporting of children's rights violations. And I think they do need to be looked at holistically. Thank, OK, thank you. Uh, Kath Bennett. Uh, who's been incredibly helpful to me to, to, to explain safeguarding sport. So thank you, Kath. Um, there is a lot of good work in sport being carried out to remove alleged predators. The difficulty arises when the criminal threshold has not been met. Victims do not wish to report to the police or criminal proceedings have concluded uh, with an acquittal. Sport will operate on a civil threshold of the balance of probabilities. Sport are then hampered in sharing information from statutory agencies. Many hurdles are encountered which are not in line with, work, with working together and information sharing protocols. In addition, there is an appeal process 
once a subject is removed. The appeal panels are usually QC's barristers who do not necessarily focus on risks, but due process and procedures, then even criticise outcomes from the statutory agencies, which are which is not their role. Thoughts from the panel re appeal and the requirement for panels to consider risk, not process. In addition, the panel's thoughts of dismissing volunteers from roles, should they be allowed to appeal? I mean, great question. Should have come to that earlier. Sorry, Kath. Um, John, James, in particular, Jenny. Or anyone? Anyone want to tackle it? Or should we do a separate? Because we should do a separate event on that. I think that's a um, whole one and a half hours. I, I feel charm. Yeah, <laughs> Kath says it. Kath, I think, um, <laughs> um, and I'm deadly serious about this. I think we should pick that up if you're happy to. Um, you know, maybe you could uh, um, moderate the session, uh, and we, we can organise that if you'd like. I think it's a really great point. I don't think if not sure about the other speakers, if you want to be involved. Um, I think we should definitely pick that up. Andrew Cook, uh, coach players comms with tackling risk in an almost entirely digital space in esports in the environments protected by privacy laws that limit direct oversight. How do you see the best practice developing in light of this shift? And Jenny, I saw your comment on uh, LinkedIn on esports and potential safe your uh, well, yeah, I do worry. I, I mean, I don't, I, I probably worry because I don't know anything about it. So I worry for myself that, I, you know, you, you always want to learn more. I do. And, you know, esports is certainly something that I would um, hope that, that safeguarding has been a priority whilst we've been setting that up. Because obviously we know what the, you know, the risks online are. And I've seen some evidence of good practice during lockdown, for example, um, having esports regulated, so having independent um, consultants coming and observing what's going on, on the, in that online space. Um, but I'm not, uh, I don't know whether anyone else wants to, to pick that that up um, in relation to esports. I don't know whether anyone. So, so, so the issues with the, I think this, and again, this isn't a wider societal issue at the moment, isn't it, with the digital space, mm -hmm. as in the problems that it presents? Yeah, and I think it's very new. I think it's very new for um, organisations involved in esports into putting safeguards in place. Great, and I thank think you. it's interesting in terms of esports and drugs and all sorts of things and abuse of power. And at what age do you talk to young athletes on programmes about what abuse of power is um, and how that's handled? Is you know in, in terms of what information is given from that to understand. So you know a lot of athletes who've experienced sort of some level of grooming said they just didn't realise. You know, and well, or uh, when older, they thought they were in consensual relationships, and then it turns out they weren't. Tony, uh, I say this in, in the legal profession. In all seriousness, you see very um, well-educated, bright. Uh, you know, you could argue at some points privileged people for, or people from privileged backgrounds get into the legal profession in a hierarchical anywhere you've got a hierarchical structure, and they find themselves, you know, essentially being influenced in ways that they would not like to be influenced in because they're fearful of their jobs. You hear this all the time. With there's various reports in the legal press about partners and others, you know, in the profession. And so my point is this power that power dynamic and people feeling you know vulnerable is is a very live problem both in sport but also in the professions that, that permeate it so i think it's a great point that you raise tony about this sort of like a you know the, the the control that someone has over someone else um reninka ramdas uh, has there been any studies examinations on the rationale of victimization by the relevant personnel as opposed to actually treating treating with the issues being reported uh, i'm not sure i I'm not sure if I've read that correctly. Has there been any study examination on the rationale or victimization by the relevant personnel as opposed to actually treating with the issues of being reported? Oh, so so is that I think she's asking the question. I'm not sure if this is right. So if you have allegations alleged against you, and um like is there anything that's done on that side so obviously it's quite should be quite, quite traumatic for you if you haven't if if for whatever reason there's suspicions raised about you and particularly if we're talking about again lack of trust in a process that seems to be a problem a potential problem as well uh again i think that might be another whole panel discussion in itself uh, um and there's many organizations that are doing great work in this space i might add in terms of we should probably send out the link later or put it underneath um, where there's some great resources. Um, Alex Richards, do we need more to fund more research across all sport demonstrating that caring organisations with mental health, welfare, safeguarding at their core have a great results? You know, more holistic approach, basically. Is I, like, I, should we, should I, come, come I, think, yeah. I think that is a really good point, if I may say. So there are, in sport, 
organizations which help uh, one immediately I, I think of is Sporting Chance, the charity which helps with 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 support and there are, I'm sure many, there are many others um, but we need to do far more of that and that comes back to the point that I made earlier that many of these um, survivors find themselves um, uh, with more serious symptoms after having made disclosure than they had beforehand and we need to deal with that otherwise we're never going to we're never going to address these issues. Yeah, I think that's yeah, that's a really good point, James. I, I wrote it down earlier because I think that's something that's again, it's, it's often overlooked. And we had a conversation about this, you know, speaking to, to survivors from various cases who have been talking publicly, and you speak to them afterwards, and then in the in the moment of like saying like, "Well done for being so brave," and "Thank you for sharing your story," you realise, um, particularly meet someone who's incredibly you know passionate and about these type of issues, um, you realise that you're actually uh, in the moment of saying this that. It, how much it is just taken from them speaking publicly um it's really you know something that you can you forget because you think uh, from outside you think oh they've addressed it they look all composed they're talking about it you know they present they you know, they work hard to to deal with those issues and it, i think it's something that you can think that once it's done once they've once it's once they've had acknowledgement and everything else it's uh it's, it's moved on and it, it doesn't um, quite the opposite cases. Yeah. Hmm. um uh mercury murray Marithi, um, in terms of advice and support, where does one start to convince sports organisations to have harassment and sexual abuse policies in place when there is a complete uh, oblivion, oblivion about it? Is it mandatory requirement of compliance with sports policies a way to go? So, Carrot yeah. flavoured sticks. Give lots of support and help to help people to raise awareness and know what to do and then the stick for when they don't. Okay, uh, Michelle Verroken, is, is it time for an international register for sports coaches as the mobility of coaches internationally has allow, allowed known predators to move from one uh, sports environment? Also, from my experience, abuse occurs in the same gender as it does between males and female. Uh, but building on that point as well, and now coming back to your point, one thing I put I wrote down earlier about this with, with World Anti-Doping, that many athletes that I know will tell you the top 10 in athletics in particular, top 10, what they were called dodgy coaches who have been involved in doping regimes of essentially taking grooming young athletes and getting them on doping regimes and not much seems to happen. And you were talking about this in terms of taking broader in the approach out. Should there be, because there's not currently, for example, in the World Anti-Doping Code, across the board in, you know, shouldn't, would you agree that safeguarding should pervade every, every regulation within sport as opposed to mm. just being an isolated standalone yeah, you know, building on Jenny's point, a standalone thing that is over here is separate. Yeah, absolutely. And I think then there needs to be a really good look at the intersectionality, for instance, of doping and child protection issues, because they really do uh, overlap cons considerably. Um, I do think I've advocated for a long time for the need for coach licensing systems. You can't take away someone's qualification, but you can take away their license to practice. And I think there's a lot more to be done in that area. And I, so, I can only spend about another two minutes. Oh, that's right. Can anyone, does everyone agree on that? <laughs> does everyone else agree on the licensing system for coaches? Yeah. Tani says yes. Because that's a big thing because I've, you know, that would seem, I've seen a lot of resistance because you'd never to be, you'd say that, say CRB checks are a licensing system. They're not of, of sorts as such, right? Of the participants, you've got some control of the participants, but from speaking to many international federations and others, there seems to be a lack of appetite, maybe from resources to deal with that. And so they always go to the athlete as the point of control, because it's easier for them to regulate the athlete than it is anyone else in and around the sport. Jenny, did you have something you want to say with that from a- Yeah, I was just going to make an analogy for, you know, in a local authority context, um, where you look at someone like a doorman on a pub, so um, they have to have a license that's issued from the local authority because they are dealing with vulnerable people, i.e. drunken people, you know, people who are intoxicated. Yeah. Um, so if, if people such a, in that role um, have a license, there's no reason why a coach who has a daily contact with a child shouldn't have a license at all. Thank you. Right, we've got two more questions. Dino, sorry, I'm going to not be able to answer your question because we're really overrunning um, and like I'm going to get killed by all the panellists who are busy. It's probably costing like thousands and thousands of pounds. <laughs> um, Emily Green, um, many NGBs have worked hard to put safe procedures in place, but I wonder to what extent the panel considered different sports could or should try to work together to share resources. Um, who wants to take that? Yes, and set up an ombudsman. <laughs> so do something to... yeah I mean it's really hard to, to tackle some of these issues you know you've got some quite young people you know 
I said before, not massively high up in the organization, trying to deal with lots of very different and difficult, you know, not every case that comes is exactly the same. And you're asking a huge amount of expertise. So yeah, you know, I, I, I don't think actually, it's, I think it's for some governing bodies, it's a distraction um, and they, they need better people, better training to deal with some of these cases. I've seen cases go on for four years, which could have been sorted in two or three weeks because people just weren't working at the right level. And on that point, so sports resolutions have got, have been trial, trialing some pooling, I think, to deal with investigations at least. Uh, is that correct, John? Would you correct me if I'm wrong on that in terms of their safeguarding support? Yes, they, they, they do and, and have, have, have tried to have investigators in place to do a lot of the heavy lifting before passing it on to the chairs to um, draft their report and, and, and publish it. So they, they have that in place already, but it really depends on the issue that's being looked, yeah. at, looked into. Okay, thank you. Vivian, Vivian uh, Rimmer, the last question. Uh, thank you for everyone else for tuning in, staying tuned in as well. Um, we need to remember that if there is an obligation uh, and uh, there are allegations of harm to a child, there is a statutory obligation to refer to a local authority designated officer who will then have an oversight of any investigation, whether police or statutory agencies are involved or not. Support is no different in the respect. The problem occurs. Duh, duh, duh. Okay, there's not a question. Uh, the problem occurs when organisations don't follow this and try to manage their in-house. Well, that's probably a great though. I'm not sure if you will agree, but isn't the problem here about again the the sophistication in it and resources that the body will have, and the people working in those bodies who have responsibility because they might not be aware of that themselves? Would you agree? I think it's two points actually. I think one is um, the knowledge of the person who has responsibility to to refer, um, and actually, unfortunately, sometimes the the reputation of the sport is a priority rather than the welfare of the child. Thank, thank you. Um, well, that is it. Uh, thank you to the panelists. I just want to say, and I say this to every every single panel because it's important. Uh, everyone's given up their time freely. Uh, we, we don't never pay any speakers. No shame on us, but I guess no. But we never pay any speakers. But pe speakers never pay us. We never take any payment for this. This is people who are extremely busy. They care about the issues and the topics. They invest a lot of time and effort to try and improve things. I greatly appreciate. Thank you, speakers, for your time in the, both the preparation. Uh, you spent a lot of time preparing for this and for now. And thank you for the excellent questions that we had and the engagement. Um, uh, here's a call to action for all of us. And I guess that, uh, I'll give you, maybe there should be one call to action from everyone I'll ask you to think about it. Maybe that's a better way to do it. Um, did you have a call to action? John, do you want to start us off? Did you have a call to action for everyone? Mine was going to be for collaboration, but. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, start off um, on the basis that engendering confidence in the system is absolutely crucial. I mean, I go on, but confidence which means trust and responsibility confidentiality is so important thank you uh, Anne, because you've got to shoot. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, two, two things very, very quickly. One is we haven't talked enough about the involvement of people with lived experience of abuse, but actually being experts in this area and the need to engage them as of right. And the second thing is we're putting out a survey um, this weekend, and please contact me if you're willing to contribute. And it's to help with our knowledge and recommendations on um, child sexual abuse and uh, emotional abuse in elite sport um, so please do reach out and contact us through uh, Safe Sport International's right. info uh, at and you send us give us the link and we'll circulate it to everyone so yeah. they've got it uh, James um, I don't think I have an awful lot to add to, to that I'm picking up on what John said it's all about isn't it um, communication about um, s somebody who's suffered um, uh, abuse having the confidence to communicate and, and there being somebody there to whom they can talk and if we can solve that um well then we will have achieved something and on that point we've got the next panel this at 5 p.m it's going to be worth taking note from that particularly from an international perspective because that's that's essentially what that panel is going to be largely about as well in terms of you know from a, a real real experiences and so thank you james um jenny i think something probably um that i mentioned before anybody who works where children or vulnerable adults in, at risk are, are around and we're working with, put that person at the heart of your decision-making process. They are ch children first, and for me, athletes second, I'm afraid. Great point. Daniel Ryan at Loughborough University, uh, Professor Daniel Ryan said the same, said the same thing. I said, what's the gold standard at a conference a couple of years ago? What's the gold standard of safeguarding? And he said that every child should be able to participate uh, safely within sport. And it nearly made me cry because it's such a simple 
a, such a beautiful point and unfortunately it gets lost in everything else that goes on. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, I'll let Tanya, you can, uh, you can have the final word. Thank you. Um, to apply due to care to sport, to all parts of it. You can't make it all warm and cuddly and lovely, but it shouldn't be leaving people, coaches, parents broken at the end of it. And do it now because you don't want to be the people picking up the pieces when yet another sport goes wrong. Great. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Thank you for like uh, thank you for the work that you do. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. Like I said, I, my call to action would be, look, if, you're, if this matters to you, if we can help connect you with people, we will. We might be slow to do it, but we'll try and do it. If you've got great stuff you're doing in terms of research or anything like that, let us know. You know, all of these guys are doing stuff all over the place as well. So we'll try and help you connect the dots. Uh, thank you. And hopefully we can, you know, continue to try and drive things and make some, some meaningful change here because it, it is the thing that matters the most in sport. And I think it always gets forgotten for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, thank you all sincerely. Really appreciate it. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye-bye.